Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Elise Downs, Director of Events at CTIA, and I'm excited to welcome you all to the next installment of our Building the 5G Economy webinar series, as today we take a closer look at 5G connected manufacturing. 5G networks are now live across the country and the first transformative applications are coming into focus. From telehealth and remote surgery to smart manufacturing, virtual reality learning experiences, connected cars, and so much more, the innovations of the future will be built on 5G. With ultra low latency and lightning fast speeds, 5G will revolutionize the industries of today and construct a platform for economic growth and innovation that will create jobs and industries and help rebuild the US economy. According to a recent report from Boston Consulting Group in collaboration with CTIA, the 5G economy will contribute 1.5 trillion to US GDP and create 4.5 million jobs in the next decade. Manufacturing in particular will benefit significantly. This 5G power transformation of our manufacturing sector will happen across the country, from small towns to big cities, creating 489,000 US manufacturing jobs and generating $212 billion in GDP revenue by 2030. Today, we'll learn how 5G is unlocking the future of manufacturing from the experts making the 5G economy a reality. In the Connecting Industry 4.0 panel discussion, Ericsson's Peter Linder and AT&T's Jason Inskeep will join CTIA's Sarah Yi to explore why 5G is needed to unlock Industry 4.0 and how 5G connectivity will strengthen the manufacturing sector and create smarter, safer, and more efficient factories. We'll also learn about current applications of 5G-enabled smart factory solutions that are coming to light today. But first, we'll get an insider's perspective from David Beckoff, Vice President of Product Development and Insights at Maypi, the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. In his role at Maypie, David produces research on workforce, technology, digital transformation, and industry trends, including a recent study entitled Next Generation Connectivity, 5G's Role in Advancing Manufacturing. Joining David to discuss how 5G can advance smart manufacturing and revitalize the industry is CTIA's Nick Ludlum. Welcome, I'm Nick Ludlum with CTIA, and I'm really pleased today to be joined by David Beckoff from Maypie. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nick, good to be with you. So I'm really excited to be uh, talking with you today because uh, we know that 5G is gonna have a big impact on, well, on lots of industries, but there's been a lot of excitement about, around 5G manufacturing specifically. Um, could you talk a little bit at a high level about the role that you see 5G playing in smart manufacturing and digital transformation? Yeah, I, I would be happy to, uh, Nick, and, and to start with, you know, give a little bit of a background about um, Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation and, and what we do. We're a professional society focused on the manufacturing uh, community and have uh, been in business since 1933. And we um, serve our uh, executives through uh, our, exec our function-specific councils, through events that we put on and, and through research. And one of the research initiatives we took on last year was around 5G and specifically um, a, a study called Next Generation Connectivity, 5G's Role in Advancing Manufacturing. Uh, and so we've seen that the, um, the opportunity for 5G in manufacturing is very large and it's still very much emerging. So um, some estimates point to, you know, by 2028, manufacturing will comprise 25% of the market uh, in revenue generation for uh, 5G ultra low latency use cases. And uh, we did a survey of CIOs and CTOs and wanted to know what they were thinking about this. Um, and it's still early days, uh, but that is uh, a little bit of background on um, the the research. I'd be glad to, to talk more next on the the digital transformation uh, aspect. Well, well, let's go right into that. So, what did what did your research find in terms of um, you know how five G can 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 support that that digital transformation? Yeah, exactly. I, I think um, what 
we see is that 5G can really accelerate smart, smart manufacturing. Uh, we see that for, for manufacturers, they've told us in research we've done that smart manufacturing is going to be key to competitiveness over the next several years uh, and, and for the foreseeable future. That's um, already over 85% agreed in, in a survey we did two years ago on that point. And um, we see that 5G really enables this smart manufacturing part of the next uh, part of industry 4.0 the next uh, industrial revolution that we're in. 5G really enables it through the, the improving connectivity, uh, enabling new use cases and, and applications, uh, and supporting these innovative technologies that are part of smart factories like artificial intelligence, advanced robotics, um, cobots, uh, things like digital twin, and, and just massive deployments of the uh, IoT um, in, in the factory. So a significant role in advancing smart manufacturing. And uh, we also found in the research very specifically a high correlation between those companies that are furthest along in smart manufacturing and those that are, uh, are also those that are most likely to say they're going to have a strategic use of 5G in, into the future. Those um, that, that are, are furthest ahead see the biggest uses. Those not as far ahead see more tactical uses. Um, but that was a key finding, I think, is that um, 5G is going to continue to accelerate smart manufacturing. Well, that's great. Um, and, and leads right into my next question. So what, where does your research suggest 5G may have um, you know, the greatest potential in a factory or production facility? Yeah, uh, and we put that question directly to some of the executives that we worked with in this in this research, Nick. I, I think uh, so. I'll, I'll channel some of that insight. They, they uh, the use cases that top the list, uh, and there are. I think what's very interesting about the space is there's a broad set, a wide range of use cases that are relevant. But um, the the top are, are quality sensing and detecting. Uh, is is uh, at the top of the list. Autonomous vehicles, uh, a very important use case. Virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, if we generalize, I'd say that the, the range of opportunities are really around automation, uh, monitoring, and optimization of existing processes. Um, but it, there's also this room to reimagine new processes. And um, those were some of those those initial use cases, and I could provide some examples, uh, uh, if, if that would be helpful. I think going into quality, for example, um, we see that that 5G is going to support the integration of devices, of, of AI, of uh, edge computing to produce more real-time uh, analytics and real-time actions. And so, for example, a, a quality sensing cameras in a uh, could could examine parts coming off of a, a, a line in production and use uh, visual systems to take defective parts off the line, as one example. Um, the the other area that we hear quite uh, a bit about and, and had a, a more detailed case study in, in this research was around the areas of mobility. And so automated guided vehicles, the AGVs are a big example there. And 5G will enable automated guided vehicles to adapt to routes using their sensors. And uh, that one of the examples of the, the companies that we did a, a profile of is Corning. And Corning was one of the first to have introduced and deployed a private 5G network. They worked closely with Verizon to develop the network and analyze placement of cellular components. Um, and they had success within, with AGV pilots. And that's uh, one example there. And as that advances, I think they uh, shared with us that uh, in this research that other use cases like augmented reality and predictive maintenance would be uh, examples to, to continue to expand the portfolio with uh, 5G applications. Well, that's really interesting, David. Um, do, now, do you see any of the use cases varying as um, 5G becomes more advanced in a manufacturing environment? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, one of the ways it becomes more advanced is the, the number of uh, sensors and technologies that are running, that, that can be running at the same time, the number of AGVs, for example, that could, could be running. Uh, and then just the use cases themselves, I think things that you can get into talking about drones for inspection and uh, just different 
capabilities that in terms of the the scale uh, cha- changes. And, and so I think that's a, one of the many opportunities um, that the industry has to see 5G ad- advance in, uh, in its enabling a variety of use cases. How can the manufacturing sector leverage 5G innovation to revitalize the manufacturing economy in the United States? You know, the, the biggest one actually is, is what we touched on in starting is around pro- propelling smart manufacturing forward uh, uh, to the extent that um, 5G is, is driving uh, smart factory implementation uh, and can support fly, fly, uh, smart factory implementation. That's really big for the opportunity. What I would say is there is, um, in manufacturing, we talk a lot about digital transformation, um, but the research that Maypai has done in, uh, in collaboration with, with Deloitte, uh, we found that n- only about half of the large industrial manufacturers that we've uh, surveyed have actually implemented and fully operationalized smart factory initiatives and use cases as of two years ago. So it is still relatively early days uh, on some of the digital manufacturing. Now, that um, is not to say there are these lighthouse examples that are far ahead of others, um, but there's a lot of room in the industry to uh, increase smart manufacturing, which we also quantified in the research has tremendous um, implications for productivity and specifically for labor productivity. And I think that's an exciting area uh, that uh, where where 5G in enabling smart manufacturing has the opportunity to um, the ability to propel things forward. Similarly, then I would say 5G is in its early stages of supporting smart manufacturing. I think that just is to say that it's there's so much more upside potential. Uh, most manufacturers in in our research are still exploring, experimenting, you know. Uh, planning or, or, or piloting if they're doing anything at all yet. And, and so it's still, um, there's a lot of room to ramp up. And the last piece I would just say is within, in terms of economic impact, the opportunity for, for jobs is, is significant. Uh, I think this is, this is something that uh, I'm sure you all are well, well aware of. I've seen estimates from uh, one source that it's 300,000 jobs over the next 15 years for 5G and manufacturing specifically. And you may have estimates that put that even higher, but that's uh, part of the, the whole picture there of, of productivity, innovation, and employment that would have an impact. To state the obvious, we are uh, sitting, uh, we are not sitting together in the same place. We are, we are uh, distanced uh, at some great distance, actually, because of this pandemic that we've, uh, we've all lived through. Do you see have you seen, does your research show the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic having an impact, uh, either you know, accelerating interest in investment in smart manufacturing in the U.S.? Yeah, very much so, especially most, most recently. Uh, when we, um, something we're, we're, we're definitely tracking and, and, and looking closely at, I think there's, there's one headline that I go back to. I remember, I think it was a Forbes article in May of last year that talked about the expectation that COVID-19 would... Um, drive manufacturing to have five years of innovation in the next 18 months. And I think some of that is really bearing, bearing out uh, that many across different areas, the remote work, um, the, the work in the, in the factories, all of the shifts that have occurred have, you know, necessity has driven in, invention. And um, the other metrics, the things that we look at, there was a survey we did uh, with our CEO uh, community back in June of, of last year. Um, and that was the time when there was a lot of cost containment efforts being put into place um, with the, the pandemic. And the expectation then was that there'd be acceleration in smart manufacturing investment by this June. And that is, uh, we are seeing indicators of that uh, in the data that we collected in, a, in another uh, additional research with Deloitte that showed that of, of manufacturing investment in factories, a larger share is going towards smart manufacturing. And then um, research that we're doing now on the future of work uh, puts issues of digitalization and smart manufacturing right at the top again of priorities along with workforce and talent issues right now. So uh, I think this is going to be an area for continued investment and a big priority for the industry. 
Now, uh, based on what you've seen so far, what are the most interesting applications of 5G and smart factory technologies that manufacturers or the industry as a whole are exploring? Uh, I'm biased. I, I've, I've been looking at this topic and speaking with people. I think that there's a lot that is interesting. I think of, of uh, as we speak with our members and, and other leaders in the industry on, on this, some things we haven't mentioned so far, and I think some some of um, what I mentioned are you know, great areas, but one, um, one that, that others are, are looking at uh, is plant consumption and energy management use cases, um, factory synchronization examples. Uh, you know, we talked about robotics and uh, or we talked about AGVs, but robotics, um, predictive maintenance. These are some of the really some exciting areas. Another one, uh, the line configuration i think especially if, when you when you look at the automotive industry uh being able to change production line configurations and um that is uh this idea of a, a modular factory that can be reconfigured and and to optimize production i think is something that's very interesting and the last i would mention is um opportunities for not just the factory floor transformation, but transformations in and use cases um, in terms of connected products. So what actually manufacturers are producing where uh, there's a benefit to having a 5G connection uh, in, uh, for example, uh, John Deere is looking at their connected fleet uh, and has purchased Spectrum in the mid Midwest. Uh, but you look at all of the ways that you open up innovation and change business models for servitization to be able to not just manufacture product, but have renewable uh, revenue opportunities from uh, new innovation uh, it with, connect with those connected products. So I think all of those uh, very interesting areas uh, for, for 5G. Other than the ones that you just mentioned, um, what possibilities are you most excited about for 5G connected manufacturing in this decade? Yeah, I, I think looking out on the horizon, um, I, I think these are fascinating to track and to see ado adoption from you know piloting and use cases toward more rollout and seeing the Im impact uh, of these are very interesting. The one that I'd mentioned going back to the um, plant consumption uh, topic in, in manufacturing, there's a tremendous amount of interest right now in sustainability and, and ESG the environmental social governance uh, factors, the, the trends and uh, for companies to make progress in this area. And I think that 5G has a role to, to play there, both from its, its own um, energy efficiencies, but also enabling consumption and efficiencies in, in the plants. Uh, so if you're using lots of sensors, um, there's some, uh, some examples that I'm aware of from research from McKinsey and others, uh, Schneider Electric, for example, deploying many sensors to reduce carbon emissions and, and re reduce energy consumption and ultimately carbon emissions. I think that's a really exciting area to look at and, and making a dent on greenhouse gases and climate change. Uh, and uh, would to, for, for more there, a couple other things that are, um, I think, exciting to watch is the future long term um, further out there of autonomous uh, uh, driving and, um, you know, even uh, read recently about the ta tactile internet as another, uh, another topic. Um, and of course, then it's, there are some, um, most probably not yet, that are looking on the horizon of what a 6G possibilities bring uh, to some of those most advanced uh, cases. Well, clearly, uh, from your research and, and, and your remarks, you've been looking at this space for a long time. Um, what kind of advice would you give to manufacturers that are looking to sort of implement 5G and smart factory solutions that maybe are on the, you know, maybe at the early stages? Yeah, I, I think that, um, and we've, in the course of the research, we spoke with more, more manufacturers that were in that exploratory phase. Uh, and I think it's, important to start when you're thinking about most new technologies is start with the, the business need um, and the, the use case, not the technology adoption. So start, start with what the understanding your needs for connectivity. Um, I think being able to start small with pilots, move, um, have an agile approach to rapidly uh, test, uh, scale, 
get buy-in, that that's that's another consideration. Then I think with with where we are um, monitoring the landscape in the U.S. Uh, and, and globally for that matter, but in, in the U.S. and particularly for the new releases, the new standards and supporting functionalities that that come with those um, new 5G technologies and the the enabled device availability for for manufacturing. Um, looking at more examples of production, uh, we talked about some briefly here, but but staying um, monitoring what what uh, is public on on that. Uh, for that matter, public network prevalence in addition to the private networks, how is that evolving? And um, and then tracking ROI and benefits for making the the internal business case uh, as well as all all important. There are many um, frameworks that we've included in in our research and in other research of of how to. Uh, approach it. I, I think that ultimately manufacturers should have just a, a, a structured approach um, to thinking about their connectivity needs and, and building the case from there and remembering that, um, as we said in, in this research, it's uh, more of a process than a, a product on, on when it comes to connectivity and there's um, uh, it's still evolving very much so. Now, obviously, as you just said, said, many of the the organizations that you've spoken with are at the early stage, um, but I'm sure you've spoken with some who are fur further along. And I wonder if you have any um, you know lessons for some of those from some of those early adopters that are worth um, noting. Yeah, and there there really are there are excellent examples that are out there of those that are that are uh, really making strides. Um, I'll come back to the the example of the the Corning case study. I I think. Um, that uh, there was a lot of learning, and, and they're continuing to expand, as, as they shared with us, continuing to expand what they're what they're doing in the space. Um, but what we learned is, in addition to the focus on technology, what we heard from them is it's important to provide prioritize the skill sets internally. So external providers can help you provide uh, fast, can, can provide faster access to smart use cases and technologies, but upgrading you know, teams and in-house talent and capabilities to scale those benefits, that's important too. And I think in this climate right now where manufacturing is with um, the uh, job scarcity of, of, for skilled, skilled talent, I think that's an important, um, something important to, to keep in mind uh, for scalability of the initiatives. I think the other, if, if one is about talent, another kind of learning is around the, the data and the preparation for the data. So I think being very deliberate and planning for the, the process and future of, of sensor data and what's required was, was another um, lesson. And also collaborating cross-functionally to be strategic in the uses of future uh, data feeds to make sure that it's contextualized data to improve the yield from, from data and clean up data feeds. That was another very practical uh, kind of lessons learned. Something that's even more technical that we heard is with 5G, um, you know, technically speaking for shop floor configurations, there's a chance of interference with uh, moving vehicles with with other objects, machines, configurations. So those need to be taken account for the propagation and for interference uh, considerations as well um, as something very tangible there. You know, and on that note, I, I, the, the, I wonder if there are some thoughts that you might share on how, you know, our two worlds, the manufacturing and the wireless sectors, um, you know, should be thinking about working together um, to to advance some of these five G use cases and applications uh, within within the manufacturing industry. Yeah, and I, I think you know, um, example of the Verizon partnership, I think is, is is one case in point. But I would actually lift this up to talk about uh, another the research that that we've done on ecosystems, and I think so encouraging the viewers to think ecosystem when it comes to this the five the G deployments because. It's um, important not to go it alone. And if I, uh, in, in other words, drawing on the capabilities of other players to help go further and faster in your, your implementations. One, um, talking again about some research that, that we did on the smart manufacturing topic is um, we found a group of, of trailblazers uh, working with Deloitte, the companies that were furthest ahead also happened to be those who were most connected uh, in working most with partners inside and outside of the organization when they drove initiatives forward. And we did a, 
a deeper dive on that topic um, and found that those who have more of an external orientation to partner uh, in smart factory initiatives actually drive their, um, are more operational on more use cases. And um, so that's, uh, that, that was a, an important finding for us. Uh, and I would also just add from this 5G study very specifically, um, after talking about the in-house teams that CTOs and CIOs rely on, the second most important uh, contributor to the ecosystem for them is the telecommunication service providers. So we had the, you know, over half say they expect to rely a great deal and 31% a fair amount on um, the uh, th those those partners to advance um, 5G. So uh, you know there are other players in the ecosystem, but I think that's the the um, the way that those close partnerships are really critical for driving these technologies and driving the innovation forward. David, thank you so much for joining us today. I found the conversation really really interesting. Hi, I'm Sarah Yee, Executive Director of External Affairs at CTIA. I'm joined today by Jason Inski, a director within the 5G Center for Excellence at AT&T Business. Jason is at the forefront of AT&T's vision for 5G, leading a team of innovation change agents to support business-centric use cases. I'm also joined today by Peter Linder, Head of 5G Marketing North America at Ericsson. At Ericsson, Peter is focused on 5G's ability to shape the future of connected technology and ultimately how 5G and IoT will change the way we work and live. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very Thanks much. for having us. Now, not only are your companies pivotal in creating the 5G that we all know and use today, but both Ericsson and AT&T are putting technology to use in their own manufacturing practices, which is very exciting. 5G in manufacturing represents a significant transformation. And we're not just talking about cost-cutting measures that can boost productivity, but we're talking about a new digital foundation that improves product quality and boosts efficiency, enhances safety, increases security and sustainability. And I'm excited to say that these are not just buzzwords, these are facts. And so, as I said, welcome to both of you. And Jason, I'd like to start with you. Why do we need 5G to unlock Industry 4.0 in the factories of the future? And what can we do with 5G that we couldn't do with 4G? Yeah, it's really interesting you bring that topic up. And we started kind of looking at this, oh man, it's probably four years ago now when we started our first venture. We started looking at, you know, what, what are the factories doing today? They're starting to tap out on existing resources, the things that they were doing before and uh, I guess industry 3.0 with wires and even Wi-Fi and unlicensed spectrum options, they've pushed it, right? They've pushed it as far as they can push it. They've extrapolated as much value as they can. So the promise of 5G offers new ways to accomplish that. And, and why 5G is interesting, you know, private cellular networks have been around for years, right? But when you look at one or two big constructs that have changed, really late LTE, but, you know, into 5G, Number one is spectrum democratization, right? So with the advent of CBRS, with the advent of, you know, uh, op models in different countries, that has become an opportunistic way. Second, uh, virtualization, right? So it used to be, if you look, we would partner with our pairs at Ericsson, big hunkin systems that would be deployed carrier grade stuff. Now with virtualization, that can be shrunk down. Both of those two things give manufacturers a look that they didn't have before. So now as they're thinking about, you know, redefining processes, squeezing more out of that bottom line, these things come into play. And then you start looking at scale, sustainability, how do they build these out in a more efficient way, less wires, less digging, et cetera. Cellular becomes a good option there. And it'll be another key, key pivotal move as customers continue to think how they can get more out of that environment on the bottom line, leading to the top line, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the efficiency there is a really interesting point that you raise. Um, Peter, what do 5G's faster speeds and lower latency mean in terms of production um, and efficiency for manufacturing companies? No, so I think that a couple of things are in place, as you say, that when, when, you, when you drive up the speeds and the latency of the, of the, of the access connectivity to the level that we have with 5G now, you can use it for actually replacing wires. So that means that you get a lot more flexibility in the in the factories. You you don't have to put the machines where the wires ends. 
uh, but you, you can move them around and you can also leverage automatic guided vehicles in the in the factory we're using this the um the shorted well lower latency and the high speed in the factory we take advantage of, especially as we move out uh, the edge uh, actually on to to customer premises so we can starting to do things like to before has been super tied together like a robot have all the electronics on it now we can separate that out so the robot has one life with its lifetime and the electronics we can put that in a distributed cloud so there's these kind of changes and shifts that are taking place to a large extent but essentially it's about not having to have a wired solution where you can avoid it and the fact that 5g is as fast as wires and, and reliable for for those kind of settings yeah, and it seems like the latency there, it 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 makes it so that it's almost seamless. I don't know if that's kind of the experience that we have with with 5G and and removing those wires, but still having that seamless um, operational system, I guess. Yeah, you, 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 you can say that it's like compared to when we when we like 20 years ago, we ordered a book and we thought it was OK. It took four days and then the book came home shipped to us. And the, the latency there was because they, all of them was shipping somewhere from uh, in books were shipped from Seattle back then. Now, when you order stuff on 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 the internet, you can get it in two hours. It's because the capabilities are moved close to to in that case a warehouse somewhere nearby here, out by the airport in Dallas, for example. And there's the same kind of transition now taking place in the in the manufacturing world. So everything that latency is is allow you to do a lot of different things that you couldn't do in the past. That's awesome. I love that analogy of just getting getting it there faster and in, in many ways more efficient, which is fantastic. Um, both of your companies actually are working every day on real life implementations of 5G enabled smart factory solutions. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just take a minute to describe some of the exciting manufacturing use cases of your app or the applications uh, that you're using that you're seeing come to life over 5G networks. Um, Maybe Peter, you can take us inside the the U.S. based smart factory in Louisville, Texas, um, and what five G use cases are being developed, and how Ericsson's five G solutions are setting this factory apart from other automated manufacturing facilities. Yes, yeah, so I think it's it's a very fascinating journey. Like if you see in my, in my role in the, in the past, we had to read reports and try to figure out what was going on, and then we had to engage with the customer and, and, and going and figuring out what they were doing. Now we are, we are doing it ourselves. So I pick up the phone quite pretty much every, every week and say, hey, any new use cases going on? So the, the way we have approached it is very much, we started with 12 different use cases uh, and they say, hey, this is the good starting point. Some are connected with 5G, some with 4G and some with wired. And um, we started off with use cases. The first use cases, which was not so obvious for us when we started the factory, but we actually built the factory during the pandemic. So the first use cases was uh, using AR and VR for knowledge transfer from other factories so that we can equip our people here in the Dallas factory with well, Louisville, the, um, the, the kind of equipment so they could be connected with the professionals either in other companies and other Ericsson manufacturing sites that normally would have traveled there. So that was the first use case, so enabling the knowledge transfer. And since AR, VR, you get both hands free, you can start doing all the, all the things you do with the expert uh, knowledge at your fingertips, even though the person is, is quite far away. The second day, uh, I think, is one fascinating. You're trying to start this digital transformation, how we produce something. So we talk about something called a digital thread. That actually means that the moment we start producing things, at the same t t time as we're producing the, the goods, we're logging data. How warm was it? Which machine did it go at which point in time and so on? So by the time all the, the, the goods has gone through the whole supply chain, we have a pretty much a digital copy of exactly how it was produced. And that helped us down the road in, in case of Jason from at and call and say, hey, this does, radio doesn't seem to be working. We can kind of trace it about exactly say, hey, there was too high humidity uh, on the 4th into May at 2.30 in the afternoon, that's what's caused the problem. So, so it, it helps us both to screen out faulty products, but it will also help us to screen in products that were perceived to be faulty, but we can prove that they were not really. So there's, there's a few of those ones. Um, there's perhaps two interesting ones that are very different. And this whole digital thread and the automation is what allow us to drive up the productivity to factor I think 2.2 .2 when we, we measured last time. 
That's wonderful. I love the I love the concept of workforce training and and applying that in and not just obviously a pandemic, but anytime I can see the value of that immediately for so many industries. Um, and then obviously the real time use of data there is just truly invaluable. That's really fantastic. Um, and Jason, I know AT and T is doing a lot of work in this space as well. Um, maybe you can tell us about AT&T's manufacturing-focused uh, 5G innovation zone in Austin. That's a place I'm looking to get to soon, uh, as soon as I can. I think it sounds fantastic. Um, and how are AT&T's 5G solutions helping manufacturing companies address challenges? Uh, and how will 5G connectivity pave the way for the smart factories of the future? Yeah, I got a great, great question. And, you know, Peter provided a lot of the the really cool use cases. But when we got started getting our hands dirty with the 5G innovation zone with our friends down at Samsung, and this is the semiconductor side, so a little different than the the, day, the guys we're used to, right? You know, it was, it was an eye-opening experience for us, right? Because you're walking into a super high-tech place and you're starting to learn about things that, you know, I started to think, well, if I get a flat topology in there, given that a manufacturing sites own all the data, the use cases are everything, right? It's a small city. The difference, right, when you look at this private network versus, say, a stadium is the, the owner and the creator of the data are the same person. Thus, therefore, they can go for the optimal activity based on cost and performance, which has tended to lean a little bit when we see these things play out, maybe a little bit more toward the cellular component because of power output on the radios, because of the control factors that we mentioned before that have now made it achievable in the space. So that led us down a path of, well, if I can do you know, it's just connectivity at that point. So what's the optimal piece? And then you start looking at things that are, you know, we kind of started rating them in a zero, five, 10 sort of mentality, right? Zero being the easiest, which is instead of that technician walking around that entire plant and writing things down at a much lower cost, I could use cellular across the plant. Thus, therefore, the innovation zone helped us look at what are those quick opportunities, the zero opportunities that are just get connectivity there, right? Make it easier on the technician. And then you move up to five, which is a you know different level. And, you know, it started in the, in the innovation zone. But as we branched out with other customers, a five could be a robot, right? And if you look at the differences between the technologies, uh, a moving robot is very jitter sensitive, right? And, and the things and the inherent characteristics of cellular make are, are more jitter proof, right? Over alternatives, meaning the robot can go faster. Right. So that's a five. There's not a lot we're doing to change things around, but we're putting the sim in the robot that wasn't there before with this new uh, either full private or kind of hybrid network that we put in place. That's another option. Then we get to the tens and the things that Peter's talking about are the tens. Right. Where I've got because the thread is better with the more data I have. Right. The thread gets tighter. The digital twin gets tighter with the more data I have. Opportune places for 5G and the massive IoT that it can ingest. Right. When you think about things and, and one of the opportunities we've seen when we think about sustainability is temperature on pipelines and those sort of things and making sure that we're not you overusing power when we don't need to. So as those things begin to bridge more sensors, more data, need more network, 5G is ready for that. And then I have this paradigm of use cases and a flat connectivity paradigm right from just give me raw connectivity to, hey, something that's a little harder, but it's a building block toward, hey, a faster robot. When I say faster in this context, the robot's moving faster, more jobs processed. And then your next one is the 10, which is I'm going to take the sensor data from my zeros. I'm going to amalgamate that with the fives of my robot. And now I've created this living, breathing organism of data, of network that, that may not just be 5G. It may have a culmination of things to ultimately get to the user, uh, the user network divine that the customer is looking for. Right. And we've tried to be very prescriptive at understanding those differences and the interaction between them, again, across those different paradigms in a, in a zero five ten sort of model, if that makes sense. One comment to that, I, I think it's very much like when, when you don't say, hey, we're not putting 5G in, but then put everything on 5G. But when you put the connectivity in, given a couple of different options, we've got a wired option, a 4G option, and, so CB, and, and then both CBR is a millimeter wave. When you get those type of different options and let the people that are there actually saying, hey, now when you have this, what can you do? It comes, it, it triggers a very, very local innovation capability about, oh, we could do this, we could do that, we could do this. So very little of what we do, hey, we have a bucket of use cases we want to try. 
But some we try and they don't work. Others we test and say, hey, this was really good. Let's do more of that. So, and, and I think this is a little bit of the fascination is I don't think it's so much about exactly which use cases you do, but it, what you can do with use cases when you have this capability. A little bit like McDonald's, when they open, they, they started with hamburgers and, and a milkshake and french fries. And then people come in at six o'clock in the morning and say, what do you want? Do you want a Big Mac and company? No, I absolutely want a cup of coffee. Okay, add that to the use case portfolio and, and have it growing a little bit like that. So it's, it's a really fascinating world, see how they work. Well, the example I like to think of is, think of our psychology one-on-one -on -one classes, right? This is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The bottom of that pyramid is connectivity, right? If you've got a foundation in connectivity and you build on that with security, you can reach self-actualization, which is any use case you want, if you've got that foundation of security and network. And, and in, in the industrial space, because they own the data, they're looking for the most efficient way to use it. What we've also found is that creates an inside-out topology. I can now go to the next state, the next place, a warehouse, the next place, a stadium, and those foundational elements carry with me. Flat neck network, to Peter's point, now I can build on top of it and tinker, in a sense, with the different use case topologies. Yeah, to, not to extend the food analogy too far, but it almost sounds like it's Burger King, have it your way, <laughs> right? There is the customization piece there and you you have that strong foundation, but then really the innovations that you can build upon it and, and the use cases seem to be very endless, which is uh, a very exciting, uh, very exciting prospect. Um, and Peter, as we build the 5G economy over the next decade, because um, truly these have these innovations have tremendous benefits um, for the economy. How do you anticipate 5G will help revitalize the U.S. manufacturing sector? You know, so I, I think there's a couple of things that we enable here. We've had a, a for quite some time we have been pushing out uh, and offshoring manufacturing to a large extent. And right now, I think we open up a, 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 an opportunity for people to rethink how we approach manufacturing. And we're rethinking, I think, on three very different aspects. It's not so much about bringing back what we already produce abroad. It is more about thinking about all the new things that we're going to produce. So in our case, 3G radios and 4G radios have not been produced at scale in the US over the last 20 years. They have all been abroad. So now when we're bringing back manufacturing, we've, or when we are creating manufacturing in the US, we focus on the latest and greatest. So it's the 5G radios that we're starting producing here. Um, the second thing I think is a little bit, when we do it, it has to be a lean approach because we're moving it from where the, the labor cost is significantly lower. So we have to be a higher degree of automation. So what we do in a 5G enabled factory is essentially we, we can automate the things a lot more than uh, before. So, so we can actually produce here in the country at the below cost that we were producing it abroad. That is an enabler. If it doesn't do that, the, 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 the business case doesn't fly. So, so that kind of significant different automation level that brings it here. And the third element of it is the uh, environmental aspect of it. So we have in, in our fact, we've paid a lot of attention and say this should be as low impact on the environment as possible. So we have solar panels across all the parking spaces uh, to, to, for, for the electricity required in the factory. I think we had 98% of the, of the waste when we were building the factory was taken care of as part of the process. We have uh, water tanks that collect rainwater that we use and, and treat before we use it in the factory. And we have ice tanks, so we, 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 we cool them down at night and then use them to cool off the building during the day. So there's a lot of things that we can do to both make it more environmentally friendly, producing the latest of the greatest and doing it at, uh, in a highly automated level. And when we approach it like that, we say, why shouldn't you produce here in the US when you're close to the customers and, and drive the goods on the roads to, to people rather than having it to produced overseas and then shipped here by air, which was pretty much the, the option. So I think you, you, you're pushing not one, but a couple of very significant levers that allow us, hey, let's bring back manufacturing and do it in a way that it becomes better than what we had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. And it really makes it a very palatable business decision, which is, um, which is really fantastic as well. 
Um, and, and Jason, turning to you for a second um, on communities, how will communities across the U.S. benefit from 5G connected factories? Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Kind of first thing I'll highlight back to is, uh, you know, you, you've got from us learning capacity, right? Because what we do in a factory, again, the data owner and creator is the same. The architecture fans out pretty nicely when you look at a uh, community as well, right? Instead of looking at the city as this independent blob, carve it up as a private network, right? Therefore, now you can start getting more portability cross, uh, what's the right way to cross over sensors to be used by multiple parties local aggregation points to keep the data in. And that gets into a lot of the technology in terms of monitoring, in terms of making sure you've got the right water safety, you've got the right sustainability products in place from a sensor and monitoring perspective, as well as a reaction perspective. So that's communities as well, in terms of skill sets, in terms of growth. And we're seeing obviously the increase in radios and infrastructure needed to support this will be, will be massive, right? But to get to the level of inter intra connectivity that will make the things go of tomorrow, we're going to need that level of depth that Peter and his team are putting together here in, here in North Texas. We're going to need the, the network providers to continue to build scale. The ecosystem has to come along. Right? You know, it, it, there's a community of people, things and assets, but there's also an ecosystem that has to play different to support it. And it's that merging of network and compute that will ultimately drive the outcomes in a community toward, you know, better whatever the target is. Right. We say smart insert an item because frankly at that point what we've done again i'll go back to it if i can create the right foundation putting the pieces on top of it become much more simple in terms of how i approach it how i build onto it whether my target is sustainability whether my autonomous smart parking better manufacturing etc we want to provide that predictability and that in turn will help the ecosystem community as well as ultimately the end user community get to optimal or Goldilocks experience as we like to think about. It. Yeah, absolutely. And it does seem like um, wireless partnerships with manufacturing, company, manufacturing companies is really kind of a sweet spot here. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could both speak to how those partnerships with the companies helps advance 5G adoption across the industry. Yeah, I'll go first on that. I think it, when I look at 5G, it's so big from a uh, change perspective, right? Going back to the spectrum democratization and virtualization, those two things alone are, are a big task for an operator to, to, to look at, right? And obviously partnering with closely like with Ericsson that we already do. But when you think about the bigger ecosystem, you've got the OEM part, you got the OEM aspect of it. That's the radios, the devices and all the things that hang off of it. But now because of this latency figure, I've got to get the end to end and I've got to have the visibility end to end in order to get to the optimal experience of time, which, again, is latency. Right. For so long as operators, we've really focused on network performance in this net next new world. We've got to focus on end to end. Right. We've got to look at it from point of origin to destination and back, whether I'm in the factory or whether I'm walking around the city of Dallas or wherever I am. Right. I've got to think about the round trip. So as we start to think about that, you see common aggregation points begin to uh, emerge throughout. And it's at those aggregation points, there's going to be opportunities for security, data security, most certainly from our, our customer, for our customers. There are going to be opportunities for uh, ecosystems of uh, analytics, right? How do I share data amongst these resources to get to the optimal uh, user experience? How does the cloud adapt and adopt the space? How do those, what are those new business market looks like? And, and finally, the cost models may shift. Right. Because the way the data is being shared and moved will shift, thus that forward opportunities to look at things totally different. Right. And because it helps our backhaul, it helps the customer, it helps the number of radios, density and where we put them. Right. So you're seeing these things slowly start to take place now when you look at digital divide. People are starting to think foundation up. You see it when you look at broadband for everyone thinking from the way up. As you see, getting into rural areas with telemedicine and those types of events, it's thinking from, OK, once I got a network in contrast to spectrum and fiber distance, what will my experience be? That's from a network lens. But I need to pair that up with the application providers from an ecosystem perspective to make sure we understand the linkage. Because if we don't, we're, we're going to overbuild or underbuild in one place. And, and that's going to be a to me that everything else is a technical fail fast, which is typically black or white, right? Either works or it doesn't. This area of ecosystem and what it looks like, we'll have some uh, operational, how do we work together opportunities 
And that's really, you know, going to be a big area that we've got to figure out, uh, not just for us, but with with the really tight partners like like Ericsson, but also other ecosystem entrants that know and we don't know yet. We have two different unique problems. Uh, I think one which is about nailing it. So trying to get it right for the first thing we're doing something totally new for an industry. So getting getting it done for manufacturing electronics manufacturing uh, facilities like is in our case getting from zero to one in that environment so from not having done it to having done it for the first factory there's a lot of learnings about some of the basics what do you need how do you put it together what is a rough business model and then when you have got, gotten it from zero to one then you can engage and start scaling more or less when you as you when you have a franchise thinking about how you're having a franchise company before you're having the concept nailed and then like hey we have a nailed concept you can go in and buy it here we even have the menu for you we have all the different things there so so that 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 nature of it so i think we've we've seen it is super valuable to be early out dipping our toes and perhaps even a two hour drinking our own champagne first uh, and 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 then coming to so I can come to Jason and say hey you know we've already figured out most of this we've figured out now we can go and and to all of your customers and scale the problem, and it's all if you take that view that the that is like the nailing and this then scaling uh, that's important for the partnership. The other thing is like we also when we're going when we're going to connect to so many other industries and so many other u- use cases and ecosystems and serving those ones. It's pretty much like moving from, hey, I was a farm and I was selling meat to a butcher. And that butcher was great at selling selling food and, and I could have pigs and, and cows, whatever, and the butcher took care and, and channeled it to the market. But now there's so many different things we're doing. So that butcher has quickly turned into a supermarket with all kinds of things that we should be able to serve. So this journey, then you, you have to be become both the specialist in what you do, but also understanding ad- enough of the things around you so you can help people to to push it over the border and saying, hey, you should have a seller network, pr- private seller network for these type of applications. And the way you get it going is like this and that. And then another uh, parts of the partnerships kicks in more for the, for the iterative uh, use case development. So it's it's a very different world from anything I think we anyone in the telecom industry has been exposed to before. Yes, very different, but very innovative. And what advice do you have for manufacturing companies looking to adopt 5G enabled technologies? I'll start first and kind of double, dovetail off of Peter. It's one, don't boil the ocean, right? M- most guys and most people that we see inside of a manufacturing plant, they see the promise, they hear the promise, they get it from a lot of different resources get educated on the inherent capabilities, right? Every G has picked up some capabilities that most people just don't know, know exist or they don't know the differences in what they're currently used to, right? And that can play into your financial um, into your financial cost scenarios, right? Because if I take the assumption of it's like something else, that may not reflect the same cost models that I could ultimately get as one example. Other things you start to look at are, in, in the past, you may have designed from inside out. In this construct, maybe I can design from in, outside in, right, in terms of how spectrum propagates different in this type of environment, right? So net of it is, I guess the first thing I, I typically look at is we got to get educated. we got to help our customers get educated on the inherent differences, right, that, that are bonuses that whether it's LTE or 3G or 2G, they've just been there, right? Things from session separation down to APN management, et cetera. They've just been there. We've got to get a granular... And, and, that, and as my role at AT&T and AT&T and Ericsson, we should be doing that. We should be helping our customers understand that because that's what we do every day. Second thing beyond is do an inventory, right? And, and it's not a, hey, what's your 5G use case? It's what's your use cases? What are you doing today that you would like to do? And it may not be 5G that does it, but it's a, it's a check to say, hey, what could I squeeze out of this if I change something? And what we're finding is oftentimes, the shiny object use case is where people gravitate, but the value use cases are right there in front of them that they didn't even think, hey, just put a SIM in it kind of scenario and that changed, you know, ROI immediately. So in that it's education and then start working toward that zero, five, 10 priority. Those two intact of, of a methodology we use, which is kind of like a six way match look, we look across six or seven different things 
we'll kind of get you to what's the optimal solution that you can use. And like I said, the good news is there is no really wrong answer. There's just a lot of them. And there's a lot of nuances that you can use. And finding the optimal can be can be the challenge. Uh, and for us at at and that, that's all ultimately where we are right now is we feel like we got a pretty good portfolio. So it's how do we get to the optimal with our customers? And those two things typically start at education and use case. Chiming in on that one, I think that I think the first one you said, don't boil the ocean. That is so critical because everybody thinks that 5G is something that ooh, it's, bef- it's before and before and then you get 5G and then it's something totally different. But it's it's more kind of a journey like when we went to college, which is really very education in, intensive. So that the, 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 f- the first thing we do to college is not to figure out what car we're going to buy in five years. It's like, how do, how do we, how do we, what are the th- three classes we have in the first semester and how do we nail them? And then we, we can go to three other classes after that. And they've gradually become more and more and more complex. So start do an inventory of the use cases, start with low hanging fruits and say, Hey, we don't know everything. We're going to start with this back to my McDonald's analogy. You, you can start a burger restaurant with, with uh, hamburgers, uh, soda and, and French fries. You don't have to have a whole lot more, all the other stuff apple pies and coffees and sundaes and shot, like all these things that can come in later iteration. And the important stuff is you get the first thing going, like a few key things and say, Hey, if we just did this, our life would be better. And, and they're, they're kind of significant. And then an iterative journey and plan for it. 5G, the, the journey happens in the stairways. So a stairway to 5G is like a number of different steps on the journey. And also there to like, we discussed, we're having a conversation right now with our team and say, hey, we talked about 12 use cases. I say, oh, all 12 still relevant. No, nine or three of them we, 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 we have tested and we don't think they provide the value we wanted. Okay, let's take them out of the pack and let's put in some new one instead. So that you also dare to challenge it all the time. This is something that should make your life better. Every day it should allow you to test new things and also if it doesn't work, throw them out and throw in something new instead. So you keep pushing, pushing, pushing for 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 development. That that's where, where I think a little bit of the of the key to success and the final learning from college. Don't wait a year or two. Drinking beer in the first year in college was not a success recipe to get out faster, and it will not be a success recipe here neither. <laughs> I love no that. I love that. Thank you so. Um, on that note, and those those wise words, um, Jason and Peter, I can't thank you enough for joining CTIA today to discuss the role of manufacturing and um, how it's helping build the 5G economy. From what we've heard, there's a lot to look forward to as we embark on the 5G decade, particularly as the manufacturing sector's adoption of 5G continues to drive the development of smart manufacturing use cases. Next generation wireless connectivity is key to building our 5G economy, and we're excited to see what's next for Industry 4.0. Thank you all for tuning in today, and a very special thanks to our speakers, David, Peter, and Jason, for sharing their valuable insights with us. If you missed a part of today's program, or you would like to share it with a colleague, the webinar will be available on demand on our website, ctia.org. You can stay up to date on all of our latest events, including the next installment of our Building the 5G Economy webinar series at our website and on Twitter at CTIA. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event.